Let us begin the program. Here's Dr. Jonathan Myers to welcome us all. Thanks, George. Really a pleasure to be here today. I really appreciate you all coming out with uncertain weather forecast uh, to be part of this event. It's exciting for us to have the opportunity to reach out to people who are interested in glaucoma as we are and to talk more about glaucoma with people whose lives are affected by glaucoma outside of the office. The subtitle for this that uh, Rita Stern put down, the meeting the challenge of glaucoma through education and research, really captures so much of what we try to do outside of the office and sometimes in the office. And this conference is an important effort in that regard. And we're going to talk a lot about the different aspects of education and research today. George has already uh, thanked some of the key people and shown you a lot of the sponsors and supporters of this event. I'd like to personally, again, thank the Glaucoma Service Foundation for their uh, extraordinary support of this event, especially in, on the part of Rita Stern, who works tirelessly for months on end to make this event possible, to organize it so it runs well. And I'd very much like to thank Will Harley and Dr. Harley, the Dr. Harley's Foundation, who have been major supporters of this event for years and make this event possible. I want to say just a few minutes of uh, thoughts about glaucoma. You know, sometimes people say, what is glaucoma? So the Academy of Ophthalmology in their preferred practice patterns defines glaucoma. Now, uh, when any definition has about 100 times more words than the issue, it starts to get a, little, get a little complicated for a simple glaucoma specialist like myself. So let me call out key aspects of this definition. It's progressive. It's chronic. It involves pressure, intraocular pressure. There are also some unknown factors we'll talk about. And all of this leads to atrophy of the optic nerve, which is where vision loss comes from. That still gets to be a convoluted and complicated discussion of what is glaucoma. And that really emphasizes the academic side. When I think about glaucoma, you know, I think about a blind uncle, one of my patients who's an uncle and is blind and can't play with his nieces and nephews the way he did. I think about people who are upset and concerned and anxious because their wife is having glaucoma surgery. For all of us who've taken eye drops, there may have been an element when, where is that eye drop? And when did I last take it? And Dr. Lee today is going to talk about some of the many things today that are involved in gaps of therapy. And a lot of patients have gaps in therapy. The other thing about glaucoma is always on my mind. It is largely silent and undiagnosed. So half the people in America who have glaucoma don't know they have it. Around the world, it's even more than half the people. And it's a major a uh, major cause of vision loss. Most people come in when they've already had a lot of damage. So glaucoma in America affects at least 3 million Americans. Over 2, 2.5 million have open angle glaucoma. There are many Americans with angle closure glaucoma. And there are hundreds of thousands who are legally blind. And for every person who's legally blind, there are many others whose life has been impacted by vision loss but may not yet be fully legally blind. Deb Robinson's going to talk a lot about how these 3 million Americans uh, can try to navigate our healthcare environment, which is increasingly complex. And later, Dr. Michael Weisbord's going to talk some about the non-American burden of glaucoma, in particular in his experience treating people through uh, Will's outreach in Haiti. There are a lot of things that can make you at greater risk for glaucoma, being related to someone who has glaucoma, uh, being of African descent, being Hispanic, getting older, Getting old isn't easy, is it? Well, increased risk is dramatic as we get older uh, for risk for glaucoma. And all of this points to a genetic connection, and we're lucky today to have Janina Capasso, who's going to be speaking with us later about some of the genetics involved in glaucoma. So glaucoma has a long and distinguished history, not just of blinding people, but of interesting clinicians and scientists to talk about glaucoma. Hippocrates talked about glaucoma 2,000 years ago. The reason we call it glaucoma is because of the way with uncontrolled glaucoma, when the cornea fails, that it develops that grayish, bluish hue of a blind eye. And that's what was described by Hippocrates. And so a variety of clinicians over the last 2,000 years have talked about what causes it and how we treat it, different surgeries coming to the present day. All of all issues with glaucoma, all types of glaucoma, center on the optic nerve. 
and what makes the optic nerve unhappy in glaucoma, we talk a lot about pressure because pressure is the one treatable risk factor for glaucoma and worsening glaucoma now. But there are other things from blood factor, a lot of interest in the media with growth factors. It's not just good for the muscles, good for the optic nerve. It turns out if your cerebrospinal fluid pressure is too low, low cerebrospinal fluid pressure can be a risk factor for glaucoma. How we address that, we're not sure. I'm going to talk briefly about structural support and how the optic nerve can withstand or fails to withstand pressure. Later, Dr. Spaeth is going to talk about nutrition and recent research in America that nutrition may have a role in the development and prevention of glaucoma. Of course, there are a host of other factors that contribute to glaucoma, and there are a lot of things that we don't know both about glaucoma, its treatment, and things related to that. And Dr. Lisa Hark's going to talk later about some of the efforts we have at Wills looking into researching different aspects of glaucoma. Some of the research we've been involved in in the last decade also have pointed to roles of the mitochondria, the energy building blocks within the cell, and how the failure of the mitochondria can lead to optic nerve disease and glaucoma. We talk about a variety of different types of glaucoma. We talk about open and closed angle glaucoma, and you can fill a large series of textbooks with splitting and dicing glaucoma into ever smaller and more particular subsets. Often we don't fully understand why one type of glaucoma is really different than another. When we talk about glaucoma in open and closed angles, we're talking about anatomic changes within the eye. So just a sort of baseline for today, if you're not familiar with the eye, if you took a hypothetical eye and cut it in half, the front clear portion is the cornea. Behind that is the iris, the colored part of the eye. The hole in the iris that lets light in is the pupil. And behind that is the lens to focus the light on the retina, the film in the camera. The optic nerve sends about a million individual neurons to different areas of the retina to pick up the signals from the retina of light and send those signals to the brain. How big is the optic nerve? About a millimeter to two millim millimeter and a half to two millimeters at the back of the eye. The center of the eye, the vitreous cavity, about four milliliters. How much is that? That's about a third of a tablespoon. So the inside of the eye is not a large area. Fluid is made back here behind the iris, comes through the pupil, and drains here in the trabecular meshwork. We talk about the angle between the cornea and the iris as in open versus closed angle glaucoma, if you hear that term later today. And you're going to hear about fluid inflow and fluid outflow. The balance of fluid production and fluid drainage is what determines intraocular pressure. So Dr. Scott Fudenberg is going to talk about efforts to change fluid outflow and lower pressure with treatment treatment that may not include eye drops. Dr. Mantravati, who unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, he's a wedding event that he is to be at today, although not his own. And because of that, he's here in video form only, but he's going to talk some about surgeries to reduce pressure. Most of you have seen this device or been on one end of this device or the other, and that, of course, is the classic Goldman applination tonometer, which is how we measure pressure, which is so central to the concepts of glaucoma. However, a pressure is not, as they say, a bell curve. If you look at 1,000 people who don't have glaucoma, although their average pressure is 16, there are many people who don't have glaucoma who have pressures in the mid to upper 20s. And why these people are better able to tolerate pressure, why their optic nerves don't become damaged, is not well understood. For that matter, many people develop glaucoma at low pressure, and why their optic nerves can't withstand the lower pressure is not well understood. But wherever you start, the higher your pressure is, the more likely you get glaucoma and the more likely you get worse from glaucoma. In fact, every point of pressure increases your personal risk of getting glaucoma. Doesn't necessarily mean you will, though. So again, most people with a pressure over 21 don't actually get glaucoma. And a good number of people in America who do get glaucoma don't have high pressures. So how high your pressure is matters. Your susceptibility matters quite a bit. Higher IOP, greater risk, lower pressure, lower risk, of course. Here's the optic nerve. This is from the American Academy of Ophthalmology's slide set that we use each year to teach medical students what an optic nerve should look like. The red lines, of course, are the blood vessels, the dark ones, the veins, the lighter ones, the arterioles. And here's the nerve. And this central area here we call the cup. It's a little dimple in the center of the optic nerve as the neurons come out and spread over the retina. And the cup-disc ratio here, the ratio of the dimple in the center to the whole nerve is about 0.3, according to the American Academy of Ophthalmology. 
Well, glaucoma causes the optic nerve to die from the inside out, and so the cup-disc ratio gets larger and larger. And you can see here that the cup-disc ratio is larger, perhaps 0.7, and the cup-disc ratio is in between here, perhaps 0.5 or 0.6. We could also instead talk about the thickness of the rim, the actual neural tissue that's still there, the rim-to-disc ratio. But you can see the changes that occur with glaucoma. Why does this happen? We're not sure. If you take an optic nerve and you strip away all of the neural tissue, underneath this circular area is a structural area of support called the lamina cabrosa, and these pores in the lamina cabrosa let the individual million neurons go through the out back of the eye to reach the brain. There is a lot of evidence that defects in the structure, that larger pores here that don't support the neurons well enough, leave the neurons more susceptible to damage from high pressure. And so a lot of research is now going on about the structural support and how some people and why some people may have defects in areas with less support for the neurons. And that may explain in part why some people get glaucoma at lower pressure or continue to get worse despite good pressures. Artists have often tried to render what glaucoma patients see, and they show this constriction of the visual field and loss of the peripheral vision. It's rarely that obvious or that simple. As the visual field loss gets worse, sometimes it often involves, in fact, the center areas, and that's, of course, much more troublesome. We hear, we'll hear today from Ryan Edmonds about how to, as he says, see around glaucoma. We're going to hear from a number of other speakers about how to make the most of your vision despite the damage that's inflicted by glaucoma. Dr. Moster is going to talk about how visual field defects, as shown here, affect patients' quality of life and how they have to cope with that. And these are just different measurement tools to quantify and qualify the way that glaucoma is affecting patients' peripheral vision so that clinicians can know if it's stable or progressive. So glaucoma is a leading cause of vision loss. It's treatable, of course, but even with treatment, many people still get worse. So that's among the many things we don't fully understand about glaucoma. And again, I want to emphasize how often glaucoma is silent and unseen, and that's why today we're having an open screening for people who haven't been checked for glaucoma because of the importance of both looking for glaucoma and highlighting the need in society for everyone to get complete eye exams. I apologize that after my discussion today, I'm actually going to go up to be part of the screening, and I'll miss most of the other talks, although I'll get to see them later in recorded format. So I'm glad to have you here. I appreciate all the other speakers and their efforts today to make this an informative and interesting day for you and for all of us. And I hope you enjoy today, today's CARES conference. Thank you.